name is John Golan, and I'm going to be presenting a short review of a study that was put out by the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, and hopefully providing a little bit of insight as to what some of the key takeaways are from that study, as well as into what some of the gaps are in that particular analysis. The study in question was released this past April and focuses again on the future of air superiority as we project 10 to 15 years from now. And among the conclusions that is drawn by the study, and certainly the one that's going to draw the most attention, is the assertion that an effective sixth generation fighter may look similar to a future bomber and may even be a modified version of a bomber or the same aircraft. So effectively what the study is suggesting is that in the future, air combat maneuverability becomes less important and it is more important that a future fighter be able to carry lots of weapons and fly over long distances. The study highlights a number of trends over the past half century, including the key role of situational awareness, transition from guns only to missile dominated engagements, the integration of hostile IFF systems, again those are systems designed to interrogate non-friendly IFF si signals to verify the identity of other aircraft, the role of AWACS in battlefield management, and most recently the emergence of infrared search and track systems. The study also highlights growing concerns over U.S. force projection capabilities in the Far East, where the number of friendly air bases are fewer and where they are further removed from potential conflict zones. What the study proposes in response to the evolving aerial battlefield is a new air dominance model, one that relies on a combination of bomber-sized command and control centers and unmanned air vehicles. The assumption, of course, is that both the manned command and control centers, which would be bomber-sized aircraft, as well as the UAVs would all be low observable and that the UAVs would be armed with beyond visual range missiles. In this particular instance, the study further assumes a stealth on stealth engagement whereby the opponents would also have some variety of stealth capability, low observable capability, and that the principal sensor for tracking and engaging the enemy would become infrared search and track. Unfortunately, there were a number of gaps in the data set from which the CSBA study drew its conclusions. The study does not differentiate between BVR missile kills that were launched from beyond visual range and those that were launched from within visual range. In other words, just because it was a radar-guided missile that was capable of beyond visual range launch does not necessarily mean that it was in fact launched from beyond visual range. The study also accepts at face value the air-to-air -air kill claims made during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, failing in so doing to take into account the cultural differences in defense reporting between the West and the Middle East. This is effectively equivalent to accepting the combat reporting of Baghdad Bob during the 2003 Iraq War as if it were gospel. So the study takes at face value some 290 air combat victories claimed during the Iran Iraq War. To put that into perspective, that is more than from all other air wars in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s combined. The study further credits the Iranian Air Force with 62 kills by F 14 Tomcat crews using Phoenix missiles. Now, this flies in the face of U.S. Central Intelligence Agency assessments from the 1980s which indicated that shortages in spares and coolant had rendered most of Iran's air-to-air -air missiles inoperative. The CIA also reported that only three F-14 Tomcat pilots had actually completed the entire training syllabus in the Iranian Air Force, and that Iraqi fighters were able to carry out repeated attacks on Iranian-bound oil tankers with no appreciable losses throughout the war. Again, there was a fundamental difference in norms for reporting between Middle East countries and the United States and other Western countries and our allies. It's akin to the fiberglass mock-up 
that was hailed as a jet fighter by Iranian authorities in 2013. Fundamentally, none of the beyond visual range kills credited from the Iran-Iraq war can be taken at face value. Now there is data that is available regarding the air-to-air -air kills that are known to have been made in the past. And that data was assembled in 1986 into a U.S. Air Force study by Colonel James Burton. That study confirmed the transition from a guns-only to a missile-dominated environment. However, out of 2014 air-to-air -air missile firings and 407 successful missile kills, only four could be credited to missiles that were launched from beyond visual range. The reasons for that are really closely tied to rules of engagement and preventing fratricide. It's not enough to know that another aircraft, another radar return, does not respond to a friendly IFF. You have to verify what that radar return is before you are authorized to fire upon it. The other source of credible, publicly available air combat data comes from the 1991 Gulf War. This war marked a turning point in the use of beyond visual range air-to-air -air weapons. This was the first war where the United States possessed aircraft in the form of the F-15 Eagle with the necessary hostile IFF capabilities to independently verify the identity of opposing aircraft. During the Gulf War, 16 out of 38 Allied victories were made from beyond visual range, an unprecedented total. That amounts to 42% of all Allied kills. However, this also means that 58% of the kills were nonetheless made from within visual range. The air dominance proposal presented by the CSBA report, therefore, has a number of gaps in it. The strategy relies on BVR intercept only, which, from past experience, would fail the majority of the time. The proposed strategy also relies on infrared sensors to achieve a BVR intercept capability. However, all of our existing beyond visual range weapons are radar guided. There is therefore no explanation for how an LO capable opponent would be engaged from beyond visual range without development of a new class of missile. The proposal also relies on a fleet of unmanned interceptors. So the underlying assumption here is that the development cost and procurement cost for a manned bomber fleet that would double as a fighter or command and control center and the procurement cost for unmanned air vehicles to go with them would be cheaper than developing a new manned interceptor. However, in order to have sufficient range to be useful, these unmanned aircraft would have to be as large as a conventional manned fighter would be. And from our Global Hawk experience, we know that there is no automatic cost reduction due to the employment of an unmanned vehicle. Global Hawk was the first time that an unmanned aircraft was developed that was similar in size and role to a conventional manned platform. All of the prior unmanned platforms had been inexpensive largely because they were piston powered and relatively short on range, speed, and payload. The eventual acquisition cost of the Global Hawk came out to be 76% higher than was initially projected. The U.S. Air Force would cut its procurement from 63 to 45 aircraft and would actually mothball all the Block 30 versions of the Global Hawk as being more expensive to operate and less capable than the manned U-2 aircraft that they were intended to replace. All of which confirms what prior cost models for aircraft development and procurement had already told us. The principal contributors to aircraft cost are empty weight, maximum speed, and the quantity produced. For equivalent range, payload, and cruise speed capabilities, the cost will be the same, manned or unmanned. The key assumption of the CSBA study is that the vast majority of future air engagements will occur beyond visual range. With the study further pointing out that only 38% of the visual range engagements that did occur during the 1991 Gulf War involved a significant air combat maneuvering component. The study fails, however, to assess what attributes 
could lead to a higher probability of kill in either a beyond visual range or a non-maneuvering within visual range engagement. Studies in the dynamics of air combat do exist, however. Most of the research in this field is no doubt classified under contract to the U.S. or other air forces. A number of pivotal studies were nonetheless publicly released in the early 1980s by Wolfgang Herbst, who was then the lead designer at MBB, the forerunner to Deutsch Aerospace, in which today forms the German component, under the Eurofighter Typhoon. Herbst's study assessed alternative attributes for future fighter concepts employing West German Luftwaffe pilots in simulated engagements. These studies concluded that beyond visual range combat was characterized by very careful power management as each aircraft maneuvered to bring their opponent within the kill envelope of its own weapons while avoiding exposure to the lethal envelope of the opposing aircraft. Of the projected future technologies explored, supercruise was identified as having the highest impact to the successful outcome of a BVR engagement with a kill to loss ratio of up to 8 to 1. In essence, the study concluded that the aircraft with the advantage in excess energy would be the aircraft that controlled the engagement, an outcome very similar to decades of experience with close combat maneuvering engagements. So in conclusion, the CSBA study raises significant issues. The future of U.S. air dominance is a vitally important subject that needs to be debated both for budgetary reasons as well as for the sake of U.S. national security. However, the CSBA study was based on faulty data. The majority of air-to-air -air kills made to date, even in the 1991 Gulf War where the U.S. brought to bear all of the modern tools of airborne warning and command as well as hostile IFF interrogation, have occurred within visual range. A strategy based exclusively on beyond visual range intercept will fail the majority of the time. The strategy proposed by the study also relies on a fleet of unmanned air vehicles without taking into account the cost of developing such a system. Further, the study assumes that beyond visual range stealth on stealth intercept capability without highlighting the need to develop a new class of missile to make this possible. Finally, Studies into air combat dynamics have suggested that even beyond visual range, the advantage resides with the platform possessing superior excess energy. This is no different than decades of visual range air combat experience. So that concludes my brief critique. Thank you very much.